This talk is about what is probably the oldest world record in sport at the moment, the record for throwing the cricket ball that was set by Robert Percival in 1882. But first, I think I need to give a bit of background to this talk and a bit of context. The talk was meant to be delivered as an after dinner speech at a conference on bluff body aerodynamics and its applications in Birmingham in July 2020. Clearly this hasn't happened because of the coronavirus crisis. And I thought it might be good if I could actually record the talk so that at least some of the potential listeners might be able to hear it. And I thought too, it might be of interest to others. So whilst this talk is certainly, I hope, going to be of interest to those who have some interest in aerodynamics, I hope too it will be of interest to those who enjoy sports history or those who just enjoy cricket. The other bit of context I need to give is the talk was originally due to be delivered to a very international audience. So I'll spend a little time near the start of the talk actually introducing the game of cricket to those who've never had the benefit of watching it. But to the talk. On page 1352 of Wiston's Cricketers Almanac in 2019, we read, under miscellaneous records, the record for throwing the cricket ball, Robert Percival at the Durham Sands race course, County Durham, 140 yards, two feet, circa 1882. For those of you who use the metric system, in other words, most of the world, one yard is 0.9 meters, one foot is about 30 centimeters. There are three feet to the yard. I'll be using yards throughout in deference to the units that the record is actually uh, written in. It's fair to say there's been some scepticism about the nature of that record. Was it possible? Was it accurate? We'll have a look at those points as we go through the talk. So, but first of all, I'll talk a bit about the game of cricket. Then the event of throwing the cricket ball then about Robert Percival, then about the occasion on which a record was set, the Durham Sands event. Then I'll ask the question, was the throw possible? So the game of cricket. In its essence, the game of cricket is very simple. A Japanese colleague of mine once described it as baseball with only two bases, which I think most cricket players, most cricket supporters would find something of an insult, but it does convey what cricket is about. Somebody throws or bowls a ball, somebody tries to hit it as far as they can. As a sport, it developed in the Middle Ages in England, in the south of England in particular, and it's well attested in many old records. In the 17th and 18th century, it developed mainly as a sport of the middle classes and the upper classes, but there's also a strong working class element there as well. Today, it's a highly sophisticated sport with various aspects. The art of throwing the ball or bowling in cricket is very well developed and there are a number of different styles that can be used. The art of batting is similarly a well-developed art and there are many excellent practitioners, both male and female, around the world. As a sport, it is very international and plays to huge crowds around the world in London, for example, Melbourne, Durham, Kolkata, and one may, it might surprise you, in Kabul. The Afghani cricket team is actually quite a, a force in world cricket these days. So that is cricket. In 1880, cricket and cricket players looked like that. We can see the typical cricket dress at the top. Uh, the rather grand fellow on the right is Dr. W.G. Grace, one of the early exponents of the game, who will get a mention later in this talk. In 1880, the Australian cricket team toured Britain for the first time, and we can see them there looking very smart in their striped blazers. The cricket ball, which is obviously of interest to this talk, 
weighs about 150 grams, it's seven or eight centimeters across in diameter, something like that. Um, and it's made of a rubber core with a leather cover and the leather cover is stitched. And it's this stitching that actually gives the ball some quite interesting aerodynamic properties that we'll describe very briefly later. Throwing the cricket ball isn't really part of cricket um, as an event. Uh, one has to throw the ball, of course, to collect the ball and to throw it back to the bowler and so on. But the actual event of throwing the cricket ball is in some ways an offshoot of the game. It was a popular sports day event in the 19th century, along with others such as place kicking, drop kicking, or throwing at the wicket, for example. The earliest mention of the event was in 1792 when Mark Richmond, gamekeeper to the Duke of Richmond, threw 119 yards at Goodwood Park to defeat the Earl of Winchelsea, who the newspapers say had never before been beaten. And there you can see one uh, aristocrat, the Duke of Richmond, getting his man, his gamekeeper, uh, to defeat another aristocrat. In the early years of the 19th century, the competitions were often the subject of wages between what might be termed gentlemen. It was used for betting, in other words. If you look at the sort of throwing lengths uh, that they were achieving, I've plotted here uh, the length of the winning throw of a, the throwing the cricket ball comp competitions between 1860 and 1900 from two sources, from the newspaper called The Sporting Life that was published in London and from a, a selection of Edinburgh newspapers in Scotland. And you can see that the majority of the winning throws are around the 100 yard mark, with a few going up to 120 yards. And there were some notable long throws over that period. 1869, W.G. Grace, whom we've already mentioned, threw 117 yards at the cricket ground court, the Oval. In 1872, in Canada, Cross Mackenzie threw 140 yards and nine inches. There are nine inches in the foot, an inch is about two and a half centimetres. Again, the same year, in Australia, King Billy of the, the Aborigine threw 140 yards in Queensland. 1873, W. Game of Oxford University threw 127 yards. 1876, W. Forbes threw 132 yards at the Eton College Sports. 1882, A. McKellar threw 130 yards in Dundee in Scotland. 1889, Crane threw 128 yards in Australia. And 1889 again, Mr. Fawcett of Brighton College threw 126 yards. Many of these, not all of them, but most of them were achieved at sports days of private schools or at universities. And that, I think, says something about the nature of the game. It was a very middle class, upper class game. Uh, and indeed, you can see there W.F. Forbes throwing 130 yards at Eton College Sports. Eton College is a major school in Britain that has over the centuries produced dozens of prime ministers. It indeed has a lot to answer for. There were variants of the game. Um, it was possible in any one event that throws would be both with and against the wind and the aggregate throw would win. Um, throws could be with both hands, one at a time, of course, first with your left hand, then with your right hand. And again, the aggregate throw would count. Very often people threw from the top of a barrel so you didn't overstep the line. Well, if you did, you fell off the barrel. And then there were handicaps where some competitors were given 10, 20, 30 yard uh, handicaps. Again, used for betting largely. Again, if we go back to the newspapers and this time look at the number of search results from the search of the British newspaper archive for throwing the cricket ball, we can see that it reaches its peak sometime in the 1860s, 1870s, and then drops off markedly uh, in the first half of the 20th century. And after that, it barely registers at all. Why is that? 
Well, it wasn't a stadium sport. The throws were too long for a typical stadium. The technique was very special, specialised, not the same as a cricket throw, an ordinary throw in the game of cricket. And perhaps because it wasn't actually included in the Olympics, it didn't retain its favour. Moving on then to Robert Percival. Robert Percival was very different from most of the people who set those early records and threw those long throws. He was a miner in the northeast of England. He was born in 1858. No one knows quite where, including himself, because on the various censuses, he gives various locations for his birth around the northeast of England. A very industrialised area, coal and lead mines. In 1881, we read in the census he was a coal miner in East Thickley in Durham. We also know he was a winner of around 40 or more cricket ball throwing events and also open wrestling events. He was five foot ten, so quite large for the day. Obviously a strong man and there are pictures there of both a freestyle wrestling event and a Cumberland style wrestling event with its own specific rules, which he might well have taken part in. We know in 1882 he married to Mary and they had six children. He was for a while the professional at New Brighton Cricket Club where he bowled and batted left-handed and uh, New Brighton Cricket Club still exists and we can see it there. He was later groundsman to the Liverpool Police Athletic Society and that ground too still exists. Uh, but by 1900 or thereabouts, he was again a coal hewer. He died in South Shields in 1918, again in the northeast, of bronchopneumonia, the disease of miners. There was no obituary. So if you come on now to the actual Durham Sands event itself. The city of Durham is an ancient city in the northeast of England again. Uh, with a very large Norman cathedral overlooking a loop in the River Weir. And in that loop, we have a large open space called Durham Sands, 16 acres uh, or 6.3 hectares. And that too still exists. It exists as a open space for people, indeed as a cricket ground. Um, top right there, you can see the Norman cathedral brooding over Durham and over the Durham Sands ground and it's also the location of what British listeners will know very well the Durham Miners Gala a industrial political trade union event that's held every year. The first issue that arose when I started looking at this was the date. Early wisdoms give the date of Easter Monday 1884. Crick Info, the cricket website, gives Easter Monday, April the 18th, 1882. There's just one slight problem in that in 1882, Easter Monday was on April the 10th. But Easter Monday in 1881 was on April the 18th. So I think we can say it was on Easter Monday. The event described in Durham County Advertiser of April the 22nd, 1881. And we're told the day was bitterly cold with a keen easterly wind, much like every Easter in England. There were shows, roundabout shooting galleries and quadrille bands providing pleasure to numbers of young people who indulged in dancing. No space had been fenced off to decide the various competitions, and there were lots of them. All had prize money for winners between seven shillings and sixpence and one pound. Again, for international listeners, there were seven shillings to the pound, 12 pennies to the shilling. There were flat races for horses above 14 hands high for around a 300 yard track, which is incredibly tight for a horse race. Flat race for ponies below that height, hurdle race for horses, a donkey race, a 220 yard flat race, about 200 meters, Quoits were played, a hurdle race, the long leap, the high leap, pole, vault, pole leaping, early pole vaults, putting the stone, a one mile walking competition, 
boys races, a mountie bank race, that's somebody sitting on somebody else's shoulders, and an open flat race, and there was throwing the cricket ball. In the Durham County Advertiser of the 22nd of April 1881, we read, throwing the cricket ball, first Percival, second Nat, five competitors, that's all. In the Sportsman of 1889, we're told the event took place on Easter Monday, 1884, and the throw was measured by the committee. The sporting record of 1897 writes, it has been claimed by R. Percival that he threw 141 yards at Durham Racecourse in 1884, but this is regarded as so doubtful that few authorities even mention it. So there's scepticism then. Wisdom Cricketers Olmac in 1908 first mentioned it, but attributed it to Richard Percival. So I ask, was the throw possible? And here I'm going to talk a bit about aerodynamics, so those listeners who aren't really into aerodynamics might care to fast forward somewhat at this point. The cricket ball is quite fascinating aerodynamically, with a number of aerodynamic forces on it, the force due to air resistance, the drag of course, uh, a force due to the asymmetry of the separation of the wake due to laminar and turbulent separation caused by the seam and a force akin to the Magnus force caused due to spin. It's only the first of those that's really relevant to today's talk. Cricket balls change during the course of a match. A new ball is shiny um, and um, the seams are well ordered. By the time it's been played with, it's rough. The seams have been knocked about a bit. Uh, fundamentally, the flow over an old cricket ball is much more likely to go turbulent than over a new cricket ball. And my guess is that in most throwing the cricket ball competitions, an old cricket ball would have been used simply for the sake of cost. The aerodynamics of cricket balls are so fascinating, there are even academics who write papers on them. So, this all aerodynamicists will know, this shows the drag coefficient against Reynolds number. Fundamentally, at the fastest speeds that cricket balls can be thrown at, the Reynolds number is somewhere in the range of the drag crisis. And the Reynolds number for the drag crisis is lower for the old cricket ball than for the new cricket ball. And so inevitably, the old cricket ball will tend to go further. For high trajectories and high initial speeds, the ball passes through the drag crisis on the way up and then on the way down. As I say, in general, old balls travel further than new balls. And for long throws, the balls actually need a javelin-like throw trajectory about 45 degrees, 40, 45 degrees, something like that. You can very simply calculate the throwing distances in still air. And for a particular throwing speed, naturally the old ball will go further than the new ball by maybe 10 or 15 yards. What are the typical throwing speeds? An international bowler can bowl at about 90 miles an hour, the fastest. Uh, uh, that is obeying the rules of bowling, which involves keeping your arm straight and bowling in a very prescribed form. An ordinary throw might be a bit faster. And indeed, there are National League baseball players, Major League baseball players, who say they can bowl at 100 or 110 miles an hour. Um, the other effect in aerodynamic terms uh, might come from the wind. It's bowled quite high, it might be affected by the wind. The average English wind speed at 10 metres height is about four metres a second. And we can see there that if we plot the throwing speed against the um, wind speed, the 10 metre wind speed, then the throwing speed required for a particular length of throw falls as the um, wind speed increases as you might expect. Now, what was the wind doing on the day in question? Can we get any handle on that? And the answer is yes, we actually can. I marked there the Durham Racecourse ground, but there was also the Durham Observatory that was taking records at that time, and wonderfully, it's still taking records. 
and I was able to make contacts with the head of the observatory and he was able very quickly to provide me with what the weather was doing on the day of the event. I suspect he was doing a fairly typical mundane academic job and this was much more interesting so he came back to me very very quickly indeed. On April the 18th 1881 at 10 o'clock there was an average wind speed of six meters per second from the northeast. Gust speeds uh, can be twice as high as that. This was probably measured quite near the ground so 10 meter wind speed would have been rather more than that I would have thought. But if we look at a six meter wind speed, we see that a throwing speed of around 42 meters per second would be required for a throw of 140 yards. And that's the end of the aerodynamics part of the talk. So um, non-aerodynamic listeners can rejoin us here if you wish. But it raises two questions, these considerations. Why, first of all, why hasn't that throw been reproduced? Well, I think the main reason is because of a lack of throwing specialists. As with any sport, it's a specialist event. And as the sport fell out of favour, obviously there weren't so many specialists. Recently, a international javelin thrower, and you can watch this on YouTube if you wish, has tried to throw the cricket ball and achieved throws of the correct order. But why was there such a reluctance to accept the record? And here I think the answer lies in the class nature, in the class form of 19th century English society. Percival was a minor. He didn't go to Eton. He didn't go to one of the major schools or major universities. Therefore, he was largely neglected. So was the throw possible? I think there's a prima facie case that Percival was one of the best throwers of the age. He was a strong young man who won many competitions and I think he could have thrown around 120 yards in still air. He probably could throw at speeds of over 90 miles an hour. Would be my guess. Over 40 metres a second. The weather was such that there might have been considerable wind assistance on the day of the Durham Sands event but the direction of the throw isn't known, so it only remains a possibility. Calculations indicate that a 94 mile an hour throw could have travelled 140 yards with wind assistance. But conditions on that day were chaotic and not particularly conducive of accurate measurement, I would suggest. And in any case, it asks the sort of philosophical question, what's the relevance of a world record where wind conditions are actually so significant. So, my original question, was the throw possible? I have to leave it to the listener to choose. Thank you.